Philip Yancey, in his book, What's So Amazing About Grace, tells the story of a man who worked with the homeless years ago in Chicago. And one day he was out on the streets and he met a woman of the streets. She lived there, she worked there, and when he met her, she was absolutely destitute. She had no money to eat, she had no money to feed her two-year-old daughter who lived there with her on the streets. Now this is a man who had heard a lot of troublesome stories from people who were homeless, but the story he heard from this woman horrified him. The things that she would do, the things that she did to her daughter to try to make money, to try to feed her drug habit. But he was there to help her. And so he asked her the question, have you ever considered going to a church for help? And a look of shock came over her face and she said, church, why would I ever go to a church? I already feel terrible about myself. They just make me feel worse. And as Yancey thought about that story, he couldn't help but think about the women 2,000 years ago who, like that woman, ran to Jesus rather than away from him. In fact, in the New Testament, when you read stories about people, the more desperate they were, the more they seemed to be attracted to Jesus. And so Yancey asks the big question, what happened? Now, throughout the course of human history, we as human beings have tried to come to terms with who God is and what God is like. And our starting point has always been the premise that God is angry with us. And it would easy, be easy to come to that conclusion. You just look at life, you look at how hard life can be, and you might get the impression that God is angry with us. And so we built faith on the premise that God is angry with us, not just disappointed, but disgusted with us. And yet somehow God begrudgingly provided a way out for us. At least so we think. If we follow the right rules, if we make the right sacrifices, if we get our act together, if we believe the right things, then maybe, just maybe, God will accept us. And so every religion, every faith system ever devised by humanity follows that storyline. God is angry at us. God's love, if you can call it that, is conditional. And if we do the right things, then maybe, just maybe, God will accept us. And once we're in, once we've done everything we need to do to get God to love us, once we're in, then we then have the right to judge other people because God's still angry at them. And Christianity has been no exception to that storyline. You don't have to look far to see it. Christians condemning non-Christians to an eternity in a fireball of torment and pain. Christians determining who's welcome to their church and who's not welcome. Christians deciding who God loves and who God can't possibly love. And yet, whether you're Christian or not, when you look at Jesus, you see a radically shocking, scandalously different picture of God. It's a view of God that is so radical that most people simply cannot believe it. Jesus says that God is a God of messy grace. That God is a God who comes to us not with judgment, but with love. Not with anger, but with forgiveness. And that picture of God was so scandalous 2,000 years ago, it got Jesus killed. And that picture of God is so scandalous today that most churches built on the name of Jesus simply cannot buy into all of it. The consequences of that kind of grace are too scandalous. And yet, it is that messy grace, it is that radical grace, that indiscriminate grace that sets Christianity apart from every other religion in the world. Because Christianity is the only faith in the world, in history, that stakes its claim on the promise that God loves us unconditionally, that God is for us, period. Christianity is the story of Jesus. It's the story of Jesus and his picture of God. The story of a God who loves us, the story of God who is for us, the story of a God who relentlessly pursues us with grace. There's a true story about a little girl who was adopted into a family and they didn't treat her very well. 
Uh, every year, the family would go to Disney World, and they would plan for months for the trip, but when it came time to go to the trip, the biological kids got to go, but the adopted daughter was forced to stay home with friends. She believed it was because there was something wrong with her, because she was bad, because she wasn't worthy or she was naughty. Thankfully for her, that adoption was, a, was dissolved, and she was adopted by a new family when she was eight years old. And one of the first things that that family did was plan a trip to Disney World. Now, she'd been dreaming about going to Disney World for all of her short life. She'd heard the stories from her adopted family. She'd seen the pictures. She, she wanted to know what it was like, but she was never allowed to go through the gates of the Magic Kingdom. So you would think that the promise of going to Disney World would change everything for her. But it had the opposite effect. She started to act out. She started to lie and to steal. And the closer they got to the trip, the worse she became. And so dad pulled her aside one day to find out what was going on. But before he could say anything, she said, I already know what you're going to tell me. You're not bringing me to Disney World, are you? And he could see the tears in her eyes, and he said, are you a member of this family? And she shook her head, yes. He said, then you're going to Disney World. But she still continued to act out. Every day until the day they finally went to Disney World. And that day she walked through the gates of the Magic Kingdom and it was everything and more that she ever dreamed it could be. She went on every ride that she could get on. She ate all that junk food that you eat at Disney World or Disneyland. She even got a stuffed animal. And that night they went back to the hotel. She was absolutely exhausted. And Dad was going to have prayer with her and he said, what was the best part of your day? And she said, Daddy... I finally got to go to Disney World. And it wasn't because I'm good enough. It's because I'm yours. And that's the story of grace. The story of Jesus, the story of grace, is the story of the rancher who paid his laborers who'd only worked an hour a full day's wage. It's the story of a shepherd who will leave behind 99 sheep to find one that is lost. It's the story of the destitute man who, digging in the garbage to find food, finds the winning lottery ticket. It's the story of a woman who tears apart her entire house to find one coin that is lost. It's the story of a father who throws a lavish feast for his runaway son. It's the story of a priest who gives silver candle stands to the thief who stole his silverware. It's the story of your creator becoming a human being just like you to live through every experience in life that you live through. It's the story of Jesus who died for his enemies. What sets Christianity apart from every other religion is its passionate belief that God loves us, period. That God is for us. But what also sets it apart is the call of Christianity on the followers of Jesus. We are called, as followers of Jesus, to meet the ungrace of the world with grace. To meet violence and terror and racism and greed and poverty and war. Not with arguments, not with condemnation, not with judgment, but with grace. To live in the world as loved children of God, to let the world know that God loves them too. To love our enemies and pray for them. To love our neighbors as we love ourselves. To do to others as we want them to do to us. To turn the other cheek. To live in the world as if grace really can change everything. Now, I can't tell you whether or not Christianity is true. You have to come to that conclusion yourself. I believe it is. But what I can tell you is that what Christianity says is that God is for you. That you're the one that God loves. That you're the one that God forgives. The story of Christianity is a story of God's lavish grace, backed up by the death and resurrection of Jesus. And that story is your story. You are the one that God loves. You are the one that God forgives. And nothing will ever change that. Let's pray together. Gracious God, we live in a world where we have to earn everything and be good enough for everything. We live in a world that seems to suggest that you are angry with us and religion continually reaffirms that belief. And then along comes Jesus to say something radically different. 
that even to this day, 2,000 years later, even Christians have a hard time getting their brains around. But I pray, Heavenly Father, that your grace would fill us and mold us and shape us to set us free to live as loved children of the Creator and then to be the purveyors of that grace to the world around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.